Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to talk about reaching out for a little bit of fantasy. That is the real-life superhero fantasy for many people who are out there in the United States and around the world who imagine becoming an alter ego of themselves, probably perhaps much like Clark Kent, to go out there in the world to make a difference by donning on a costume and deciding how they want to serve the public. Sometimes it's a great service they provide, and other times it's very questionable what their behavior does. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program is author of the book, Heroes in the Night. It's inside the real-life superhero movement. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program our guest, T. Krulos. T., how are you today? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Now, I'm guessing by your energy there that you were up all night riding around with Spider-Man and there was a lot of building hops. Uh, not last night, but many nights, uh, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> now, you came across this story in February of 2009. What kind of moved you in this direction to find out more about these real-life superheroes? Well, it, it was funny. I read just a really short news blurb about them, and uh, I was kind of like, huh, that's interesting. But um, it just kept, I kept thinking about it, you know, throughout the rest of the day. And uh, I just had a, a lot of questions and uh, kind of became obsessed with it and, and wanted to find out if there was a local real-life superhero uh, here in Milwaukee, where I live. And I searched, and I found one. Mm-hmm. Now, how did you go about finding out this? I know that in the book you talk about sort of a, a real-life superhero forum. Is that true? Yeah, uh, they have some online forums where they, they congregate. Um, a lot of them are on social media and, and talk to each other through that. Mm -hmm. So what did you learn? I mean, you were talking about in the book about how you found that your life would be taking some bizarre turns that you couldn't even anticipate as you were discovering why people do what they do when it comes to being a superhero. Yeah, uh, I thought that in order to, to write an interesting book, I would need to spend as much time as I could with them, um, joining them on patrols and, and different missions that they were doing, and uh, just kind of hanging out with them. So, uh, and uh, you know, they're they're normal people, but it's kind of strange because you'll be hanging out, having a normal conversation, and then you kind of remember, oh yeah, this person is also wearing a superhero costume. <laughs> I guess it's kind of some doing when you're sitting in a Dunkin' and Donuts and you realize, oh, wait a minute, you know, hey, uh, this guy's actually wearing, you know, a Superman outfit. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Now, tell me, um, when you came to profile these people, were there specifications you were looking for, uh, uh, things that you wanted to, to put into your book that you wanted people to know about? Um, I, I guess I was really looking for a good mix of, of different people. I wanted to find people who uh, had kind of a lighthearted approach to what they do. I wanted to find some people who are very serious about it, and uh, I think I got a good mix of, um, of people who are interesting and, and people who are maybe a little bit over the top. Mm -hmm. Now, I also like the history that you talk about here, about how far back this actually goes. Share that with our listeners. Yeah, that was really uh, amazing, I thought. I had no idea. Um, when I first started talking to these guys, I thought I might be able to track it back a few years. And um, most of this started around 2005. It, it became kind of a viral thing on the Internet. But I found that there is actually um, precedents, which I call early prototypes, that go back to uh, late 60s, early 70s. And um, they were kind of few and far between, but there were, I found, you know, about a dozen good examples of people doing this between uh, late 60s and 2000. And uh, they were some of the most interesting uh, characters, I think, because they didn't have that network. They were kind of, uh, had this idea and were doing it alone. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, for example, one interesting person I found was uh, a guy who called himself the Fox, and uh, he was an environmental activist, and uh, some, he would sometimes disguise himself in, like, uh, sunglasses and a trench coat, kind of like a, the classic spy look. 
and um, he would do sort of a monkey wrenching type things where, like, uh, for instance, he found a factory was polluting a river, so he, he clogged up their, their drainage pipe and then left a note behind uh, saying that the fox had done it. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting people who have this idea over the years. I know Thanatos was one that was pretty interesting in and of himself. Oh, yeah, I, I really... Um, that actually is one of the favorite chapters of my book that I wrote was, was one about him. But he's a, he's a very interesting and very heartfelt person. And, um, yeah, Thanatos in Vancouver, uh, his main mission was to help out the homeless population, which is huge in Vancouver. Uh, and at first I was a little skeptical because the man dresses in a black trench coat and he has a green... Uh, skull mask that he wears, and a cowboy hat. It's kind of an intimidating look. But uh, I was really amazed uh, when I was going on his rounds with him that uh, all these homeless people knew who he was, and they were really glad to see him because um, he was giving them gifts of food and supplies. And he uh, is pretty much a street legend up in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of times when people get the idea of, let's say, a real-life superhero, they might have the idea these are people out sort of being like, I guess, citizen police patrols. But that isn't always true, is it? No, not always. Uh, some, for some of these guys, they definitely uh, do take that approach and, and think it's exciting or whatever to go out and, and patrol for crime. But um, I found that quite a lot of them really enjoy the idea of inventing their own superhero persona. But at the same time, they know their limitations, so they don't they don't want to get beat up or try to beat somebody up. But they they like the the idea of it, so they find other things that they can do that are a little more uh, down to earth for them, like um, organizing charity events. Uh, some of them kind of have an activism angle to what they do. Uh, some of them do things like teach self-defense classes and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. I know there was uh, one <laughs> interesting uh, one on a guy by the name of Beasting. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. See, can't I imagine a guy true. walking around you know, with a shotgun in his hand in a trailer park and feeling comfortable about knowing somebody out there is doing that. Yeah, that's um, it's really an example of how the idea can go wrong. I think mm -hmm. uh, in that case, Beasting was patrolling a trailer park. Uh, he had a shotgun with him. He got into an argument with someone over a noise violation. Pretty much, uh, the guy was, you know, cruising around on his motorcycle and revving it up, and he confronted him, and they started wrestling around, and uh, Beasting's shotgun was discharged, you know. And, you know, it was really close to, imagine that that could have, uh, if that would have been aimed the wrong way, someone could have been injured or, or even killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beasting ended up going to jail for that for a while. <laughs> so it's, a, it's really a good cautionary story, I think, that um, this could go not like it does in the comic books. It could go very wrong. Right. Hmm. Now, uh, the thing that I found interesting, too, is you said that it didn't really matter what their religious beliefs or political background was, whatever the case is, that when it came to becoming a real-life superhero, that uh, as they focused on a goal, they found that they could actually work together regardless of their differences. Yeah, you know, I really think that's one of the cool things about the story and uh, one of the things that they might be successful in. Um, yes, yeah, so like you said, a lot of them put together differences and, um, you know, people that you would think wouldn't want to have anything to do with each other uh, were kind of drawn just to this simple fact that they love the, the superhero mythology and uh, the imagery. So you have people from different 
religious and political and uh, socio-economical backgrounds uh, joining forces to try to help people out, which is kind of a cool thing to see in a country that can that's often divided by those things, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what's fascinating is it seems like a lot of times we work from our differences against each other, and here, you know, it's the common good that we come together that's inside all of us, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, I remember as you were talking about one particular superhero who liked to go out on the highways and help people who have cars who are broke down or probably need rides somewhere, and I was remembering there was a guy that used to do that back in the late 70s, and he was known as the Lone Ranger, and he would go out there, and he would do the very same thing, dress like the Lone Ranger, catch cars that were broke down, and inevitably as he would get the car up and running, he would always leave behind a silver wrench. (laughs) <laughs> were there superheroes that you featured in your book that would always leave something behind? A trademark calling card. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, yes. Actually, there was one. Um, I found uh, that there uh, was a really, one of the most popular real-life superheroes is uh, not from the United States. She is uh, from China and the English translation of her name is Hong Kong Flower. And uh, she would, give, give kind of like Thanatos, she would try to help out homeless people and, and do good deeds, give them food, supplies, that sort of thing. And she would also give them a, a flower. Mm-hmm. I know when you were describing Thanatos, bringing him back up again, is that he had the kind of, costume where he wanted people who were in situations who felt so miserable that they would actually welcome death seemed to be his philosophy. Yes, he actually has um, a good origin story that he told me was that uh, he was doing the same thing before he found out about real life superheroes and he was giving out supplies and and one day he um, ran to a police officer who was perhaps having a bad day or was a cynical person. And uh, he told them, you know, you're wasting your time because the only thing that's going to happen is these people are going to die. So uh, Thanatos kind of remembered that, and when he heard about the real-life superhero movement, he kind of envisioned himself in being like a parody of the Grim Reaper. If these people only had death to look forward to, then he was going to kind of be a, a friendly version of the, Grim, of the Grim Reaper. It's kind of an interesting uh, origin story for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who are your favorite superheroes in real life? That I'm sure that kind of, you had a little bit of a mystique when you went out to the field to research this, hoping that, you know, maybe you'll come across something that maybe nobody's seen before. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are my favorite real life superheroes? Right. Uh, well, I, you know, I think the the local guys here in Milwaukee, um, it was really good for me because because they were local. I got to meet them over and over again over a period of uh, a couple of years. So I got to know them really well personally, and uh, I think I think they're great guys. You know, I think their heart is in the right place. What they do is a little bit unusual, sure, but you know, but it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So. Really, the local guys, it it was good to get to know them. And I still talk to them, you know, on a regular basis. I still talk to them. I know one of the kind of funny superheroes, because he's, you know, was like, okay, there he is, and people just really got used to him, was Geist. (laughs) 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 You know, you were kind of talking about this guy, and, you know, people walked by, yeah, oh, there he is. There was nothing (laughs) extraordinary about this guy, (laughs) it seemed. Yeah, uh, a few of these guys are just kind of uh, part of the scenery of their city now, you know, their mm-hmm. their common sight. Um, yeah, guys, even the, the police, we were out on patrol, and they just kind of waved and said, hey, guys, you know, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, he's, he's a, a cool guy, too. I, I, I met him uh, quite a few different times, um, got to hang out with him. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm kind of curious, did you ever run across anybody that 
seem kind of out there in their thinking, you know. I mean, these guys seem to be, you know, pretty normal people that lead regular lives, and they just decide this is something they want to do. And it's actually pretty exciting when you think about it. But people who really believe in what they're doing to a degree that it borders on, well, you kind of seem a little crazy. Huh. Well, um, certainly one of the, the more exciting parts of my book, I think, is uh, about the time that I spent in Seattle, where where I hung out with this fellow who calls himself Phoenix Jones, and uh, he has a team called the Rain City Superhero Movement, and um, he is a very, there's never a dull moment with that guy. He's, uh, he's very action-packed, and uh, I had a very intense time hanging out with him. Mm-hmm. What kinds of things did you do? Well, I uh, I went out on patrol with him and his team, and uh, he very actively tries to fight crime. And uh, this became kind of a famous incident that I witnessed while I was with him, um, called the pepper spray incident. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happened was, we were out on patrol, and we saw a group of people fighting in in the middle of the street outside of the bar. And uh, Phoenix Jones kind of barreled down this hill, ran into the middle of them, and uh, told them to break it up. And then he pepper sprayed uh, two of the people that were fighting each other. <laughs> and uh, what happened next was kind of all hell broke loose. Uh, People were very angry. They were people were swinging at us. You know, uh, one of the one of the guy's girlfriends was really mad, so she took off her high heel shoe and was hitting him on the head over and over again. And it was it was absolutely crazy and one of the scariest nights of my life. And it ended up with Phoenix Jones uh, being arrested. He spent the night in jail. How about creepy clown? Is he pretty creepy? Creepy clown? Who's that? It's a guy that I came across when I was looking on your Facebook page uh, from Staten Island, I guess. <laughs> oh, that guy. Okay. Well, that's um, that's uh, not really part of the real-life superhero movement, but it's, uh, it's it was an interesting case, I thought, because mm-hmm. it's a guy just dressing up like a creepy clown and, and lurking around Staten Island, you know, for whatever reasons, to scare people, or kind of a joke. But, um, yeah, there's all sorts of people dressing up and doing unusual things out there. Mm -hmm. Did you want to be a superhero yourself, or this is just something you enjoyed going out and finding out more about? Um, I definitely, you know, I've been a comic book fan, um, for pretty much my entire life. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I really did kind of see the appeal of it. Um, especially, you know, the neighborhood that I live in here in Milwaukee, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's a bad neighborhood, but crime happens here. And uh, I've had friends who have been mugged and assaulted. And and I hear those stories, and it, it really upsets me. And... Um, I think about how I wish I could have been there to protect them just as a superhero or something. So I, I see the appeal and, and the idea, and um, I've, some of the people I met I found to be inspiring. Mm-hmm. But um, but ultimately, I guess it's it's just, it's not really my style, personally. Right. Now, tell us about a superhero that we could certainly use this day and age, and that is Phantom Patriot. Oh. Yeah. He had um, an interesting raid going on there. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting story, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that someday I'm going to be able to write a longer piece about him, because uh, I, I kind of gave the short version in Heroes in the Night. Uh, Phantom Patriot um, is what some people would label a conspiracy theorist. Uh, he found out about this place in California that's kind of a club for 
wealthy, powerful people. And he um, adopted a persona, which at, at that time had like a, a skull mask and a jumpsuit. And he actually raided this place um, because he, he believed that they were keeping uh, people captive in there. But uh, uh, he, there was no one there, but he, he did get arrested, and he, he spent a few years in jail for that. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very interesting story, it, and it's a somewhat complex story. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of history and different stuff involved in it. But, um, yeah, I guess it, it's kind of a story of conspiracy theory and mixed with superhero mm -hmm. stuff. I think it's interesting because you have a part in your book here where you basically have sketched mug shots of these guys <laughs> you know, and basically what their charges were. <laughs> and you're thinking yeah, to yourself, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, there's um, uh, yeah, some illustrations were done by David Byer Jr. And um, yeah, there's been a few, a few of them have, that have been arrested. You know, I think I probably had uh, five or six in that section. I've been arrested for various things. And uh, again, you know, I mean, I think that there, there is a lot of inspiring stories, but there's some cautionary stories too. You know, uh, it can go wrong, mm -hmm. definitely. Well, especially as we were just talking about the Phantom Patriot, as you have charges, five felonies, two counts of arson, one burglary, one possession of a billy club, one auxiliary exhibiting a firearm in the presence of a police officer, and he ends up in prison for six years. <laughs> right. It's like, well, okay, yeah. I don't think, you know, the Hulk would have been able to tolerate something like that. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, how could, absolutely. How can people find out more about how they can get your book? Uh, Heroes in the Night was published by Chicago Review Press. Uh, mm -hmm. so they can find um, more information on their website. Uh, and the book is also available on most places you would buy books online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, and so, yeah, I think Chicago Review Press's website. ChicagoReviewPress.com? Yep. Yeah. Um, and I also uh, maintain a blog about the book, uh, which I still update, and that is heroesinthenights.blogspot.com. The book is Heroes in the Night, and it's inside the real-life superhero movement. Our guest today, T. Collis. Thank you for joining us here on the program today. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. We also encourage you, the listeners out there, visit us at beyond50radio.com to find out more. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you again for joining us. And remember, live your day past halfway.